Good morning, everybody. I appreciate that sales pitch. I encourage you to try to get through those books. They're really challenging. When you said that, someone in the back of me said, I bet it sounded better in her head. I hate when that happens. You know, you have such a good thought and it comes out just totally sideways. Uh, totally ruin a sermon. I know you don't need to hear it, but I am going to go on record and say, you've been right all along. <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, that was an outstanding message uh, that Megan gave this morning. I think she has just uh, nailed it. The experience that Megan had uh, is one that I've been in for the last 10 years or so. Uh, there's people out of the blue. Um, find out that you're holding to this theology, and they say, man, I, that's where I'm going. That's what I've been thinking. And they just, all over the place, this flame is, is, is just uh, erupting. And uh, people are l- looking for guidance, looking for a home, looking for tradition, want to get anchored in, in something. I, this is well, about a month ago. At the end of a service, a uh, young pastor came up from North Dakota. He was visiting our church. And um, basically his story is he's a youth pastor at a... Uh, in a mainline evangelical church, was a youth pastor, um, started reading the wrong books and uh, listening to the wrong podcasts, look at the wrong videos, and as he put it, you totally wrecked me. <laughs> you totally wrecked me. And I, I get that metaphor a lot. You, you, you ruined me. Because what, what happened is he begins to teach the kingdom to his kids uh, and it, it, to try and do it as discreetly and delicately and as possible, but the kids start to get it. And so the kids start to ask their parents, how come we have this giant flag in our church, and how come we spend a million dollars on our building but don't have any outreach to the poor, and how come we're, you know, so aligned with this political party and the military and all this? Uh, It ripples up to the pastor, and the pastor says to the youth pastor, look, you've got to back off of this stuff or I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And he says, I can't back off of it. So now he is there, his wife's eight months pregnant, and he has no job. (laughs) And And he's saying, what's the next step here? What do I do? And I've lived in this, I, I'd say over the last 10 years, on average about one, about a person a week, I'd say three or four a month, I, I get requests like this, or questions like this, or statements like this. Um, all over the place, people are waking up to this, this, this vision. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, at Woodland Hills, we now have uh, over 20,000 podcasters every week from all over the globe, just tapping into this you know, message. And for a lot of them, it makes going to traditional church Difficult, if not impossible. And so they're sometimes starting their own home churches uh, all over the place. It's a beautiful thing. It's also a challenging thing for the people who who go through it. And this is the transformation I uh, underwent throughout the 90s, just kind of gradually waking up to how different the movement that Jesus birthed, how different that is from what passes as the standard face of Christianity. And, and the clearer I got about the kingdom, the foggier I got about what the church has anything to do with it. And uh, you, start, you start noticing. It's hard to notice the water you swim in, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's just your, your, your culturation. But as you get the kingdom, you just begin to notice standard assumptions that just don't fit any longer. And you start to call those out and name them. And um, some people love it, and a lot of people don't love it. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's just the way this thing goes. That's how it was in Jesus' ministry. That's how it is, that's how it is today. But uh, that kind of awakening is happening all over the place. That's why I, I believe, and this has been kind of my message to the Anabaptists over the last seven or eight years, I've just been felt, felt called to sort of begin to speak into this, that if the traditional Anabaptists are able to embrace folks like this youth pastor I just talked about, uh, embrace and welcome and make them feel welcomed, assimilate folks like this, and commission them to be church planters, I believe that the Church of Anabaptist uh, fellowships are, are positioned to experience an incredible, beautiful, wonderful revival. Like that last song we sang, the, world, the world's about to turn. And um, I, 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 it's a kairos moment. It's a kairos moment. But it all depends on whether we're able to embrace folks that are going to be very, very different than what has traditionally looked like Anabaptist. It means we have to accept and even celebrate that the face of uh, Anabaptism is going to change, uh, and change in some, some radical ways. 
And the challenge, is, as Megan so wonderfully po- pointed out, is that there's the main challenge, there's a number of them, but the central challenge, I believe, is that owing partly to the history of Anabaptism, the early persecution of the church, uh, and the kind of a, a retreat from the world that happened there, uh, what happens is, is when, when, when you have a culture of people who are already countercultural in a lot of ways, and that they're largely isolated, that enculturation goes very, very deep. It becomes part of your identity. It can even become synonymous with the faith. We identify it as the faith. We don't even make the distinction between culture and, and, and kingdom. Whereas folks who are in a more cosmopolitan environment, if you're bumping up to people from other cultures all the time, it tends to make you a little more flexible with your own because you're aware that this is just culture. But to the degree that a, person, that a group is isolated um, and, and it, it could happen that you begin to look with suspicion towards all other kinds of cultures. Um, and that becomes part of the tradition. The challenge then is to be able to lighten the grip on that to welcome people who are going to look very different. Because so far as I can see, in this, this new kingdom movement that's rising up, this neo, neo-anabaptism that's going on, it, it, it encompasses just the widest range of ethnic diversity, style diversity, background diversity. It, it, all over the place, it is as diverse as you can imagine. So embracing that is, is going to be a, a challenge. Whatever we identify as culture is our normal. That's our normal. Uh, and so when we come, up with, come, against, come in contact with cultures that are different from us, it feels abnormal, strange, alien, other, maybe even suspicious, maybe even ungodly. Um, it, it just doesn't conform to our normal. And it's always hard it, it, yeah, to, to go beyond your comfort zone, your normal, to embrace other people's normal. Um, it's difficult for, for all of us. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, teaching uh, at uh, Sunshine Festival. I don't know if you've ever uh, been up there. Probably not. Uh, but it's this rock festival that goes on for three days. <laughs> Any rockers out there? <laughs> and, and they decided to include some teaching components in this, so they asked me to t- uh, come and do a, a couple sessions uh, um, while the rock concerts are going on, which was a bad idea. <laughs> they meant well, but it didn't work. So I, I am teaching in this tent. This is, I think, July, hot July day in this tent. So it felt like uh, a sauna. I, I, we should take off our clothes and smoke a peace pipe. This is like a sweat lodge. It's like, <laughs> it, it was so hot. So I'm trying to do this teaching in this hot circumstance. But that was already tough. Then next to us, not very far away, they have four stages there playing different types of music. There was this grunge band, a Christian grunge band. Now, I don't know if you know what grunge is, but it's very abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say definitive. It, they have this, uh, it's called monster voice. Uh, and, and so the singing, singing, is like it's... <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. That is what it sounds like. <laughs> and the guitar is just screeching. The drumming is really cool, though, because the guy's really going fast. And what can be bad about fast drums? I love that. So the drumming I appreciate, but everything else was just... So I'm now having to compete with this... <laughs> Sound like Linda Blair on the Pope Exorcist or something. You know? So I'm, trying to, I'm screaming over this monster voice. Finally, I let the class out a little early because we're all drenched in sweat and I'm competing with the monster voice. So I go and watch these folks for a while. And these, there's, they're all teenagers, and they're slamming into each other. And they, they were like, running, bump into each other. And they, they, it was like pinball. It was crazy. Uh, and it, it, it looked and sounded to me demonic, frankly. And, and yet this is supposed to be a Christian band here. But I'm a 57-year-old white guy, so you've got to take that into consideration. So I, I watched this, and I'm just sort of amazed at this. I, I've seen and heard that kind of music before, but I've never seen like, it played out, let alone in a Christian environment. And these people, people are slamming into it. And they, they look, I mean, alternative. <laughs> Very alternative. Parts of their body are pierced that I'm sure were never supposed to be pierced. It, it was like, <laughs> what's up with that? So... Later on, as I'm walking around in, in between sessions, I run into the lead singer or growler of, of this band. And I get to talking. I'm interested. You know, I, just, I want to find a little bit about him. So we, we, we get into a conversation. And uh, this kid was on fire for Jesus like nobody's business. 
just, un- and he starts giving some testimonies about these, what's been happening to these kids, who a lot of them were listening to kind of demonic grunge stuff, but they come to Christ, and now they, they, they Christianize it. They just bring that part of the culture, and they, they Christianize it. And he, he gives some incredible testimonies. And that just shows how a lot of times they discover the beauty of, uh, of, of a different way of doing things, a different way of looking, a different way of being, a different way of singing. Uh, you, you, to, to discover the beauty, you've got to push past your own comfort zone and, and, and just take down the walls of judgment and embrace folks as they are. It, it's, it's a challenge. But it's not negotiable. It's necessary. Uh, and at the end of it is beauty. I remember the first time I preached in a, this uh, all-black Pentecostal church. Um, it was a different experience. Uh, I got up to preach, and I start with my text, and go about a minute. And at some point, all of a sudden, as I'm starting to get into the flow of things, a guy in the front row stands up and says, You know what you're talking about! And I was like... <laughs> And I, I kind of paused, and I went, thank you. <laughs> and it was, uh, then I, I go on a little bit longer, and someone starts to go, Amen, bring it. Uh, word. And, and, and they start, you know, if, if I have ADD to start with, so this is kind of a distraction. <laughs> Will you just shut up? I'm trying to say this speak here. But I go with it. And in time, I begin to get a flow to it. You know, it's like, okay, it, it, there's kind of a rhythm to this thing. I'm catching on here. And, and, uh, uh, I, I, not only was able to tolerate, I began to really kind of enjoy it. I mean, it, it starts, I find myself all of a sudden going places I never dreamed I would be preaching because somebody said something which got me going on a different track. I preached for an hour and a half because half the time is them talking back at you. <laughs> you know, you can't get near the content of it. Man, it's just like going along and someone's you know, just like, we're bring it now. Come on, man, you got it. And it's, it got to be a joy. It was just wonderful. Um, it, it, takes a, it takes time. It takes effort to get used to kind of a cultural difference. But there's a great payoff at the end. There's one lady in this, in this, this uh, congregation who was just, as the sermon went on, she cried louder and louder and louder and louder. Um, and I thought, man, she really doesn't like my message. <laughs> or, or, it, it was like that was over the top, even for an uh, already loud audience. She was just losing it. And I had to kind of like, you know, with my ADD, push that out of my consciousness to pay attention. At the end of it, though, the pastor came up and talked to me about her. He says, uh, you know, thanks for pressing through that. Um, she's been like that. She came to our fellowship about two months ago, and she's always like that. But the reason is because she had uh, sold her baby for some crack. She was so addicted. And two months ago, she came to Christ and experienced forgiveness. And whom much is forgiven, the same loves much. And she's just overwhelmed by the beauty and the grace of God. Uh, and you know what? Anyone with that story gets the right to, to ball during a whole service. Uh, it's to, 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 to acclimate it, to embrace another culture is challenging, but there's a, such a beauty at the end of it. It expands you. It, 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 it draw. Now, some things I think maybe we just never get. I don't know if I'll... Could I ever really appreciate the growling? I doubt it. Um, but you can appreciate that others appreciate it and, and embrace that. And some parts of culture, you know, if you're too old, you just aren't going to get it. I, 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 well, ten years ago, uh, I and three other, Shelly and I and three other couples, we do life together. We're a really close, small group. And we all decided to move into the city. We're all living in the suburbs. We decided uh, we felt called to move into the city and kind of start living more communally on the same block and maybe eventually in the same house. So we move into the city. Um, and it's just been a wonderful experience. I mean, uh, never... And it's no judgment on suburbs. I would just say it's different. And one of the ways it's different is that there's all this beautiful diversity, uh, which, which grows you. It stretches you. It's, it's... So I uh, start to attend a uh, barber shop. I started to go to get my hair cut at this barber shop. It was about a block away from my house. Uh, and um, in 10 years, I'm the only white guy that I've ever seen there. I think it's, it's an all-black barber shop. But they cut hair so different than I ever got at cross cutters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's just a different experience. Um, and and it, there's a, a... I mean, the, my, my barber says he's sure that I... He's, he, you have a brother somewhere in your background giving your hair. And that's not Irish. That, that's, <laughs> it, 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 and maybe he's right about that. But uh, um, there, there's... For one thing, it's very loud. The Judge Judy is playing in the afternoon. They have this television. And, and there's a, just a lot of boisterous bantering going back and forth. 
and a lot of humor and laughing. It takes an hour to cut the hair because half the time they're giving high fives or they're just talking or whatever. Uh, and, and it, it, so you're getting a lot more than just a haircut for, the, for, for 25 bucks. It's, it's, it's great. But there's a, there's, a, there's a part of that that I can't, I, I can, I love it, I laugh with it, but I can't join it. Like, I've tried. There's a, you've got to throw in a jibe or throw in a something. And so you'll say something that you think is appropriate, like, what does he know she's talking about? And they all just kind of stop and look at you like... <laughs> Sounded better in my head. <laughs> but, so, you know, that's just... I, I, I don't, maybe I just am not going to get that part of it. But you can still embrace it and appreciate it. This is, I think, the challenge that... Uh, um, traditional Anabaptist face, because the movement that's rising up out there, that flame that's growing out there, uh, it is as diverse as you can imagine. And to embrace that, to welcome that, to join that, to help build this temple, as Megan said, that's going to look very different than what we've ever identified as a temple. Uh, it requires collapsing all judgments, being stretched, uh, going places we never thought we'd go, joining songs, worship styles we never thought we'd, we, we'd, we'd, we'd be joining. Not just tolerating difference, but affirming it. Because if you tolerate it, it's clear that you're just tolerating it. And it's like, I, I won't, don't like to bring my wife to my, I've, last year, uh, gotten into speed metal, which is not the kind of metal. It's, a, it's orchestral. It's really, I love the drums, and it's so fast, and it's just, it's like tailor-made for someone with ADD. It's just like sensory overload. I love it. But I don't want to bring Shelly to it because I know she's just tolerating it. And I can't have fun if she's just tolerating it. I know she's doing out of love, you know, like, okay, for you, honey. But it's like, no, she's not jumping up and down. And she's not, you know, come on, you got to uh, at least affirm it, celebrate it with me. Otherwise, it kind of ruins the fun. It's the same thing when we embrace others. We maybe don't have to do it exactly like they do it or can't really get in the flow of it. But to affirm it, celebrate it, because as a matter of fact, this is a very biblical thing. Here is... As I've looked at Anabaptist theology, I've grown into it, kind of discovered this thing 10 years ago, and been exploring avenues of it. What is one of, the, I think, the greatest caveats in traditional Anabaptist theology has to do with this very point. And this is what's working against traditional Anabaptists at this point. Paul says in, in Ephesians 2, I'm sure you know this passage, that uh, Jesus, when he died, he tore down the walls of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles, which is the paradigmatic division of all people groups. He tore down those walls and in his one body created one new humanity. Beautiful passage. Jesus died for this, to tear down those kind of walls. That's why Paul elsewhere says in Galatians that in Christ, there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave or free. Uh, rather, if you've been baptized into Christ, you've been immersed into Christ, you wear Christ, you've been clothed with Christ. What he's saying there, I believe, is just that all of the distinctions and differences that have divided people, that the world invests so much into because they identify with it, all of those, once your, once your identity is in Christ, that one foundation that we heard about this morning, all of those are rendered inconsequential. Now, it's not that we don't see those, because obviously we do, but in the kingdom, those become part of the beauty rather than part of the problem. In, in the, the world's way of doing things, since you're getting your identity and your life from the distinct way you do life and the distinct, distinct way you look and the distinct culture that you have or whatever, well, those become points of division, but when you no longer are getting life from that, from the way you look, the way you sing, the way you do church, the way you build temples, uh, when Christ alone is your life, well, then all the different ways of doing it become positive things. That's why in Revelation 21, I love this passage, it says that the gates of the heavenly city are always open, and the kings bring the glory of their nations to it. Uh, there is a glory there, a distinct beauty in the different ways people do life, do relationship with God. A distinct beauty that's there, that's only, we only arrive at if our identity is in Christ, not in our distinctness. But once our identity is in Christ, now these different ways of reflecting that glory, it, it, it contributes to the kaleidoscope of the body of Christ and puts on display the full array of, of, uh, of, of God's glory. The way a rainbow reflects light and it, it brings out the different colors, the different possibilities that are involved in light. It's not just pure white. No, there's a few colors. So also the beauty of Christ gets reflect, re, re, refracted and displayed in the different ways that people have of being human and of, of worshiping him and of walking with him. 
Um, it puts that on, all that on, on display, the beauty of it all. That's why on the day of Pentecost, I'm convinced, I, uh, people were speaking in d- different languages. The Holy Spirit came on them, they began to all speak in tongues, and, and different people groups heard them in their own language. And I think part of what is being reflected there is that where the Spirit of God is at work, the walls of Babel will be torn down. The kingdom is a, in, intrinsically an anti-Babel uh, uh, body. It, it, it's there to tear down those kind of walls. And people begin to hear each other and talk to each other. People who normally wouldn't be interacting are going to be interacting. Where well, the Spirit of God is at work, that kind of diversity is going to be being put on display and happening. Uh, which means this, folks. And here, Receive this. It means that diversity, this isn't just a politically the motive here at all. Diversity is an intrinsic kingdom good. In fact, it's an intrinsic kingdom necessity, seeking diversity. Along ethnic lines, along style lines, along background lines, gender lines, all of that, it's an intrinsic good. To the degree that a group is homogenous, to that degree it can't put on display the rainbow, the, the, the multi-colored, the, the different glories of the different nations and people groups that are out there. One aspect of the atonement is missing. Jesus died for this. Which means that we need to be pursuing, seeking out. Not just like, oh, okay, we're open to this. See, we're not just open to people believing that in the forgiveness of sins. We proclaim it. Jesus died for sins to be forgiven. Uh, and so we proclaim that. That's a necessity. We're a heretic if we don't proclaim that. Jesus also died to create one new humanity. Uh, and, and to have people coming together who otherwise wouldn't be coming together. And therefore, it is as non-negotiable as preaching the forgiveness of sins or any other aspect of what Jesus died for. Um, this is, I think, one of the major omissions that, I, so far as I can see, in Anabaptist theology, maybe partly because of the, the early persecution and the isolation, this just never got put on the front burner or even on the radar screen. But you shouldn't feel too bad about that because it hasn't been on anyone's radar screen. <laughs> The early church struggled with this, right? This was, this was a major problem in the early church. I mean, Jesus, last word, go out into all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Some years later, where did we find Peter? Still in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, they're just hanging, out, hanging around there. So God has to, in Acts 10, give them this vision of, uh, you know, the, the clean and unclean animals and, and how that's, you know, don't go by that anymore. You know, there's nothing unclean that goes in the mouth. Finally, Peter gets it. You know, I see that God's no respecter of persons. Duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But see, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to get this on the inside. Um, he's an enculturated Jew, and, and enculturated Jews just don't do that. And so God has to kind of beat him over the head a couple times. And then later on, we find in, in, in Galatians 2, Paul has to chastise Peter because he's still a segregationist. He's still eating over why the Jewish folks doesn't want to be mingling with those dirty Gentiles. This is hard stuff to get. It's always been a challenge. And then Acts 15, the first church council, it's about this. What are we Jews going to do with these Gentiles? Do they need to become Jews or to what degree? And they got to work that out. They have a discussion. There's a debate. It's, 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 it's tough stuff. And they finally come up with, okay, can we just ask them to do this, all right? You know, meet us halfway. Stop fornicating. <laughs> and don't eat bloody meat. You know, and things that were just very, very you know, offensive to them. Uh, and so they, they, they meet in the middle. It's a tough conversation to have, but it's a non-negotiable. It has to happen. Uh, I have found at Woodland Hills that, that this has been a very challenging thing for us. Um, we just have to be realistic about this. We're right now, uh, our church is about 21% non-white. The last demographic thing we took. Which I guess if you're, if you're uh, less than 80% majority any one uh, race, then you are considered uh, a multi-ethnic congregation. So I guess we qualify by one percentage point. Um, but it's been challenging. Um, I, I, we're sort of stagnated there and, and are having trouble pushing beyond that. But knowing that diversity is an intrinsic good of the kingdom, a necessity, we need to seek it out, uh, you just you can't ever plateau and be satisfied with that. It's, it's, we basically reflect the demographics of our neighborhood, but we want the kingdom to be uh, going beyond that. It's challenging in leadership. Um, I, there's, it's just, I, there's been some struggles. Here's, here's an example of one such struggle. I asked an African-American a musician, to uh, be our worship leader. Just a wonderful, uh, incredible musician. Um, and so he, he comes on staff, um, and 
Uh, he is, at this point, the only African-American on our staff. And, and at this point in our church history, I th- our church is probably still 95% mostly white. I always thought that if you just say, if you just proclaim, hey, the kingdom, you know, it's for all people of all colors, all nations, all ethnic tribes, people just start showing up. <laughs> it, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, it, it's a little more difficult than that. So, so he's on staff. Now, at some point, there's this guy in our congregation who's crazy. I'm sure none of you have had those, these types in your congregation, but... <laughs> I've read that, actually, if you go to any city corner and did an interview uh, and put, give folks a standard psychology test, um, psychological evaluation, one out of 50 people walking the streets would be clinically insane. Uh, and I suspect that a far greater percentage actually attend church. <laughs> Think about it. So uh, I'm aware when I'm talking to a crowd of uh, a thousand, there's at least 50 Looney Tunes out there. <laughs> Uh, thank God for him, praise God, but uh, that's part of the diversity. Uh, so this one guy, had, he, he, he was touched. Um, he would be leaving uh, messages on my phone about, uh, oh, he had some revelation, and we're doing communion wrong, and uh, the rapture's going to take place, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but he also left some messages, uh, a few messages, on uh, this worship leader's phone. And he, the messages to him were, was that you need to take that do-rag off when you lead worship, because the Bible says a man shouldn't have a covering on his head. Now, I meet with this guy twice, trying to talk this through. saying, well, look, if you're going to insist on the covering, uh, you know, no covering on a guy's head, why aren't you insisting that women have to have a covering? Because that's part of the whole thing, same thing. But don't worry about it. It's a cultural thing, and I tried to explain that. He'll have nothing to do with it. He, he just was mad at this person's having a do-rag. So he left a couple messages there. Our worship leader was very concerned about this. He'd bring it up every staff meeting. Like, we need to put something in place uh, to, you know, a restraining order or something. This is going to go bad. Now, my advice, it's real intention advice, was this. You know, brother, in any given service, there's 50 of these folks out there. Uh, this is standard stuff in the ministry. Get used to it. You know, this is, this is just what happens. You're going to get nasty phone calls. You're going to get pushed back. Um, I, and so I, 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 I said to him, don't yourself get crucified on six-inch crosses. Uh, this, is a little, this is a little cross. You know, don't, don't sweat this stuff. And I'm trying to toughen them up for ministry, right? Because you've got to have thick skin in ministry. Uh, I, I think I'm going by the book. What I didn't realize is I was going by the big white book. Because, see, I couldn't enter into at that point what it would be like to be an African-American with an all-white staff in a mostly white congregation. And having a history you've had several times where uh, when a white customer complained about you to your white boss, you got fired. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm living from a different, totally different perspective. Um, and this thing didn't end well. At one point, this crazy guy approached our worship leader out in the gathering area and started pointing his finger at him. And uh, our worship leader pushed him back. So this guy came at him with fists, and then they had to break it up. And then, since you know we're teaching nonviolence here, the worship leader has the next week apologize for having gotten aggressive. Uh, even though he was accosted by this guy. And this has caused a deep wound, a deep wound, that I'm sure he ever, ever could quite get over. Um, and it's because I was operating out of my own normal, uh, my own normal. I'm not threatened by someone, you know, making accusations against me or claims or whatever. Um, what I learned from that experience and many, many others like it is that I need to, as much as I can, out of relationship with others, trust their perspective. Trust that perspective. Even if I, I can't fathom how you'd be threatened by this, I need to believe it and then try to understand it, get on the inside of it. But it's challenging. We don't know the water that we swim in until we can meet a fish that's swimming in different water. And that's how we grow. That's how we expand. These are difficult issues that just need to be grappled with. And it takes a while. It's, it's, it's long. It's hard. But it, it's absolutely uh, non-negotiable. Another factor I found, and this is a, something that you always be aware of, as Megan mentioned this morning, our, our struggle is never against flesh and blood, though we usually think it is. But it's never against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities and powers and rulers and authorities uh, in, in the spiritual realm. Uh, they, they, are, they try to play us, to get us to not believe that uh, our battle is not against flesh and blood. They want to make it a battle of flesh and blood so that we're not doing warfare against them. And we do warfare against them precisely by refusing to ever make flesh and blood our enemy. Uh, if it's flesh and blood, it's someone we're fighting for, not someone we should ever be fighting against. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have tough conversations about stuff, but you always do it in love for the purpose of fighting the principalities and powers. I say that to say this. 
I found one of the issues in leadership. As long as I, a white guy, am at the, the top of the helm here, whenever I need to confront something on staff, uh, particularly with a- African Americans, there was a funkiness that happened. It just was fun. It wasn't like n- n- normal things we have to correct things or challenge things. There was always something else going on. And it took us a while to figure out how things would get misunderstood and cloudy and confused. And all of a sudden, we're not even talking about the issue. We were talking about something else altogether. And, and sometimes the person would say that this is a race issue. And you're saying, well, how is this a race issue? I'm, I'm just trying to confront the way that you interact with people at the desk or something. I came to call it, we all came to realize, I called it the shadow of the plantation. That there's no way you can, for 300 years, have whites ruling over African Americans, um, enslaving them, profiting off of the blood of their backs, uh, and then you say, okay, we're done, and not have, you're feeding the principalities and powers there. Uh, and, and those are strong principalities and powers, they're well fed, and they persevere, and there still is that clouding polluting influence that's going on. And so what we've learned is that, that, when, when that when there needs to be that kind of confrontation, the first thing to do, and do it in the middle and do it at the end, surround the whole discussion with prayer. Well, you pray together. Okay, we are in this together. We're on each other's side. We're fighting the principalities and powers who are trying to divide us and make us uh, enemies of one another. Uh, to, to always remind yourself the real battle we're fighting is the principalities and powers. Uh, and that's the one thing that can keep us trusting one another going forward and, and working at this in some, some uh, c- constructive ways. It requires being honest, truthful, and being willing to have difficult conversations. And what I'm told is that uh, traditional Anabaptists are not necessarily that refined in the art of confrontation. <laughs> Non-resistance came to be identified with non-confrontation. So you wage war by doing the silent treatment. <laughs> I'm not talking to you anymore. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Healthy confrontation. See, yeah, it, it, it requires to be, to, that you have um, a willingness to say things out loud, to be honest. Uh, but always making sure that your love, uh, you speak the truth, but you speak it in love. Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth. Here's how I see things. Uh, receive how others see things. Do it in love, but say it straight. Because if you don't say it straight, it always stays under the surface. And that's the thing that sabotages all this. Sabotages everything. The plus, I think, is this. Here's what I think the Anabaptist tradition has going for it. That's a huge plus. Is that uh, part of the culture, and it's a very biblical part of the culture, is humility. And having a servant attitude and being willing to suffer for others. Because this requires something of suffering for others. For the sake of the kaleidoscope, for the sake of this rainbow kingdom, for the sake of diversity, which is an intrinsic good and necessity of the kingdom, you, you suffer the hard work of trying to get on the inside of, of a, a worldview that is so foreign to you. And it requires sacrifice. It requires kenosis, as Jesus set aside, you know, the prerogatives of, of his divinity to become a human being, Philippians 2. So also, it requires those who are already in any cultural setting to set aside the prerogatives, the privileges that go along with being the dominant voice, the dominant face, in order to enter into worldviews that otherwise uh, would, be, would, would, would remain totally foreign to you. This is why I think, uh, you know, whenever we have things like we've had recently with the shooting of African, um, uh, unarmed African-American males, um, all of a sudden we see this great cultural divide. It's always beneath the surface there, but when it comes to things like this, or the J trial, or anything that has a race component to it, there's this cultural divide on who is to be believed. And uh, it's because, to a large degree, folks live in different worlds. I've never been pulled over and questioned uh, where I, I, I thought the policeman, it was because I was white. Or, you just don't like Irish, do you? <laughs> yeah, you're, no, it, it never occurs to me. But uh, I am in relationship with uh, plenty of folks for whom that's a fairly regular occurrence. My son-in-law, he's African-American, was uh, out with a friend driving a pretty nice Jeep uh, and was pulled over, uh, and no real reason was given. I policeman just wanted to check some things, and the policeman noticed that he had, they had a bunch of, of uh, bags in the back seat. They're coming back from a business thing, and they had a lot of their equipment with them, so there's a lot, it's full of stuff. Nice Jeep, full of stuff, got to be drugs. And so the, the cop asked if, if uh, he can um, check the car. Do you mind if I do a little search? And the owner of the car uh, was my son-in-law's friend, says, no, fine, that's fine. So they get out, 
and he starts to do a search of the car, looking through all the bags. Uh, and meanwhile, he tells my son-in-law to go stand by the police car. You know, it's, uh, you, put, you go over there, I only want to deal with one of you. So he's checking out the car with the owner of the car. My son-in-law's over by the police car. At one point, and this is cold, it's about 30 degrees out, he puts his hands in his pockets because his hands are getting cold. The cop notices it and grabs his gun. He says, get your, he didn't draw it actually, but he has a hand, hand on it. And, and, and this is the two days after the, the first shooting. My son-in-law is like, I'm going to get shot here, you know? So he raises his hands like this, and um, uh, nothing came of that, but it was just, he, he was suspect for putting his hands in his pocket because he could have had a gun there. Then I, that, I don't think that would ever happen to me. And I'm not saying most police are like that or anything. And I, this policeman, I'm sure, just doesn't notice the categories he's operating in, the water he's swimming in, the assumptions he makes. But see, if, if that's your history, then you're going to interpret things differently than you would if you have my history. And, and what I've noticed is that as a white person, I float in a realm of privilege that other folks don't necessarily float in. I don't bump into walls that other folks bump into. And so if I don't bump into those walls and I assume that my normal is the normal, well, then I'm not going to believe others when they say they bump into those walls. I'll come up with alternative explanations. Um, and, and that will keep going on like that until those who are able, who have the power, can set it aside to enter into the worldview of those who don't. And that only happens through credible relationships, where you actually have f- folks you're in a relationship with that you believe, and then you learn from their perspective and their stories. Uh, and that broadens you, become aware of things you otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, become aware of. You see, if that doesn't happen, then the diversity of the kingdom of God just can't be manifested. Uh, this is the decision I find that people have to make. Uh, one of the challenges we, we found is this. I found that even the folks who are like most amen when you preach on diversity, yes, amen, hallelujah, they, they'd be, oh, let's go for it. As soon as the rubber starts hitting the road, uh, a lot of them hightail it. It's easy to say yay, but now when your blonde daughter is interested in an African-American man uh, in 11th grade, out to the suburbs we go. Uh, you know, we, we, their own assumptions kick in, and either people make a decision of saying, I am going to call into question all my assumptions in order to enter into perspectives that are different from me, or they say, I'm sticking with my normal, and I, I'm out of here to protect my normal. We either are defending our normal, as Megan was saying this morning, or we're suspending our normal and, and setting aside to enter into the perspective of others. And that's where the beauty is found. That's where, that's where the beauty of the kingdom uh, is, is uncovered, but we've, it requires going beyond our comfort zone in order to do it. One final thing I'll say is this, and then we'll open up for some questions. To talk about the beauty of diversity and the necessity of that as a core kingdom value, something for which Jesus died, Raises the question of then, what is the unity? We, it can't just be diversity for diversity's sake. Um, no, that, that's... What is it that we're having the diversity around? What is the fuel for? What, what's the, the core shared thing? What are the limits, in other words? What are the limits of this? How far are we supposed to stretch? Uh, what's the core here? Um, and, and this is, I think, a particularly important question for uh, traditional Anabaptists to be asking at this time because what I've observed is that among some who are, have become aware of the, cult, the sheer cultural nature of, of what has been identified as traditional Anabaptist, as they've been setting that aside, but sometimes the core of the kingdom is getting set aside too. As a means of becoming relevant to the culture, some of the core distinctive features of the, of the Anabaptist tradition are being compromised. Because uh, they just want to act like So they end up looking no different than mainline evangelical church. Uh, at this Kairos moment, I encourage Anabaptists to do the exact opposite. Uh, in your advertising for seminaries and schools and, and every, the whole PR thing, I would not try to downplay the distinctives. I would maximize them because there's a whole population out there that's starving for it. They don't need more of the same. They've already got that. What they want is an alternative way of, of, of following Jesus, uh, which is, I think, the kingdom way of following Jesus. I, I would, not in a prideful way, but I would just be out loud about the, how different... This is from what has gone under the normal guise of standard sort of Christianity. Uh, it, it, it's different. But what, 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 what are those distinctives? I, I would just say this. I, it, this, is, this, is, this is another thing that needs to be talked about. Uh, it can't just be decreed. But from my perspective, what, the way I identify the neo-Anabaptist movement that's rising out there, uh, it's just, I, it's, 
sort of a slogan that evolved for me is, it is about a Jesus-looking God rising up, raising up a Jesus-looking people. That's kind of the core. A God who looks like Jesus raising up a people who are increasingly looking like Jesus. See, in, in the Anabaptist tradition, and I see this as being the center of the center, uh, there was always a strongly Christocentric view of God. Uh, I've, for this book I'm doing now on, on interpreting Old Testament violent portraits of God, I've been lo- reading a number of the early Anabaptists on what they said about the Old Testament and things like that. And really, they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, some were trying to, you know, go back to an origin in the early church and see it as allegory. But they all agreed that whatever we do with this, our marching orders come from Jesus. Our picture of God is to come from Jesus. And we'll try to explain that. I think if they would have lived more than a generation, the scholars, they, they would have made progress in this, but they all got killed too early. And then the, the whole thing kind of came to a halt. But um, they all agreed on, on, on a Christocentric vision of God. God, Jesus isn't just part of what God's like. He reveals the fullness of what God is like, especially on the cross. God is this self-sacrificial love. Uh, and strongly, strongly Christocentric understanding of God. Uh, don't compromise this by blending it with any other portraits. No, this is what God is really like. But it wasn't just what, what God is really like. He's also the incarnation of what we are called to be. And this is another just central distinctive of the Anabaptist tradition. We're not just called to believe in Jesus. We are called to follow him and, and, and to imitate him. Uh, and at the center of that is taking up our cross and being willing to die for enemies because that's what he did for us. That is, that is just the, the, the most distinctive thing in the world. Uh, that got lost very early on in, in, in Christianity, right after Constantine and all that. Um, to, to actually be a follower of Jesus. A Jesus-looking God who, who raises up a Jesus-looking people. That is, I think, the, the, the central gem of the Anabaptist tradition. And with, with that comes one more implication, and that is, to the degree that any culture that we are in has elements of it that disagree, that are in conflict with conformity to Christ, to that degree, we are called to revolt against the culture. We're called to be countercultural. Anything that is anti-Christ, anything that causes us to compromise uh, what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, we have to live in revolt against that. So it's, we're literally revolutionaries, revolters. In the same way Jesus was. He put Jesus in its cultural context, and almost everything he did was, was, was standing against some aspect of the fallen culture he was in. So also, to be a follower of Jesus is to revolt against by how we live, uh, to live in revolt of the consumerism of this culture and, and the, you know, the ungodly nationalism of it, the celebration of the military and violence and every other thing that disagrees with, with Jesus, that we're called to revolt against. So then the balance is this, to discern the degree to which a cultural difference is simply a cultural difference and can be redeemed. It, it, it's consistent, it can be made to be consistent with the, the, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Versus the aspects of any culture, our own, because that's the hardest to notice. It's easy to notice how ungodly someone else's culture is, but not our own. We tend to just Christianize that stuff. But to wake up to that and to say, to the degree that that is not in conformity with Christ, to that degree, uh, we have to revolt against it. That I would put forth as the criteria to always be assessing. Be maximally flexible on everything that is compatible with the character of Christ. Be inflexible, being against everything that's inconsistent with the character of Christ. And if, if the Anabaptist con- tradition can begin to do that with the humility and self-sacrifice that has been such a central part of this, this tradition, humbly say thing to people when they come in, when you embrace them, um, you know, that, that uh, help us learn you. And humbly and say, teach us. Uh, you know, how, how just, how, we'll, we'll give you the essence of what following Jesus has been like in our tradition, but we need to learn from you. Uh, uh, you know, teach us. At the same time, say up front, say up front, this is so important to say, look at, uh, here's what's going to require of you. Uh, will you, first of all, trust that our hearts are in the right place even when we're stupid? Because when it comes to cultural stuff, we do stupid. Uh, um, we're going to make, uh, we're going to step on your toes, and you're going to step on ours, and, and let's just be upfront about that. But will we trust that we are all trying and trust our intentions? Um, and then have patience. Lots of patience. It requires patience on both sides because... It, it, this doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy. It's a long haul. But it's so cr- cross-like. It's so cruciform. It's so beautiful. Uh, and it's a non-negotiable. If, the, if that can happen, I believe the Anabaptist fellowships are going to experience uh, a revival while well, the world is about to turn. The Anabaptist world is about to turn. Uh, do it right, your heads are going to be spinning. Uh, but it'll be a beautiful kind of dizzy.